Now, as with other exploit demos, I want you dazzled and bewildered by the beauty of an exploit in action. And only after you've taken in the exploit show will I explain how the trick is done. Now, of course, this uh, demo video is originally meant to be shown after the full explanation in the original researcher's work. So, oh well, putting it out of, out of order just again to show, you know, without further context, a exploit just looks like magic that you have no hopes of understanding. But we're going to provide you the full context of the exploit in this class. Explain something before we go. Uh, this is the pixel two. You can see well. This is the attacker. This is the phone we have compromised. Uh, we, we own, and this is the target, the time, the pixel two XL. Okay. Now we are going to send a packet. Uh, we prepare prepare the attack on the pixel two. Yeah, you can see. Explore start. Uh, we are sending out the packet. Okay. Uh, the first payload is uh, one uh, one hundred and forty three lines. Okay. We are still send the packet. Okay. The uh, pixel two XL is G eight six. Okay. You can see that the S index is enforcing. And we are unable to uh, use the D message from on the uh, shell. Uh, we are we are in the shell, okay. So the pixel two is sending packets. Okay. You can the the, the whole process need uh, about three three minutes. Uh, uh, we, we don't think we have to wait. Uh, let's speed up, speed up, okay. okay. Attack is not finished, you can see the SD Linux is still enforcing. Okay. Okay. Let's speed up about uh, three minutes. Okay. Okay. The portion is done at uh, this time. Okay. Let's check, check the view out. Okay. Hmm. Uh, just wait for minutes. Okay, you can see it's permissive. So we have fully controlled the Linux kernel and set set the IC Linux to permissive. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are still in the shell, but we have controlled the Linux kernel. Okay, now we can read the D message, print out the kernel message. Okay. okay, so the attacker's goal is that they are an attacker who's in wireless proximity to the victim phone, so they got to be in Wi Fi range. And their goal is to exploit the Wi Fi, and then they want to break into the modem, and then from the modem, they want to break into the Linux kernel running on the main application processor. So let's see how they do that. Here's the overall goals, sub goals. They basically overflow the global, create an acid pointer, get some sort of limited arbitrary write, get a full arbitrary write what where. Then they're gonna call existing code to change page permissions to defeat uh, non-executable memory by marking memory read, write, execute. They're going to write their code into that read, write, execute page. They're gonna execute the code. And then from there, once they've got full code execution, they're going to pivot into the baseband and pivot into the Linux application processor. So here was our overflow. As we said before, you write 44 bytes at a time, and each of those is going to go into one of those B0 size slots, and ultimately when the item count is greater than or equal to 10, it overwrites some globals right here. And of course, if they couldn't find something useful in the first 44 bytes of globals, they could have just increased the item count further and kept smashing further into the globals. But what they did find was something useful so at global buffer plus six plus b0 plus uh, times 11 plus c which is easily smashed by that 44 byte write there's something that the author calls a smart pointer and so we're going to see the semantics of how that works and how they smash that in order to achieve an acid pointer that points wherever they want to allow writes wherever they want so here's the pseudocode for the usage of the smart pointer as given by the researchers so you've got the address of the pointer, which we said was global plus six times uh, plus B zero times 11 plus C. 
All right, so this address is what actually gets smashed by the overwrite. And that is going to corrupt the smart pointer. We're going to just call it a character pointer. That's going to be an acid pointer now. And then we've got OTA data pointer. So this is going to be over the air, meaning data coming out of the Wi-Fi packets. That's going to be copied into the MAC address. All right, that's common for wireless protocols and network protocols in general. There's something like a MAC address, and it is ultimately attacker controlled data coming from within a packet. And then other OTA data is used to copy into this thing that's called byte C, byte D, and byte 14. And then there's a check that tests the bits of the smart pointer, and it tests bit 0, and it checks whether or not bit 0 is 1. If it is 1, then what it's going to do is a mem compare of the smart pointer plus 6 to the MAC address that came from there. So basically, wherever the pointer is pointing, you know, this got smashed, it's going to look at that address plus six and it's going to say does that equal the mac address and if so then it's going to continue on and if not it's going to skip over this code so the attacker wants it to successfully get here okay sorry first point uh, basically even though the attacker doesn't control what's in memory at smart pointer plus six they can just set the mac address to whatever is uh, in memory there so once they have you know the capability to dump firmware and uh, see the contents of memory They can just uh, you know match the Mac address to whatever memory would be at smart pointer plus six So again, it's not that they control this It's just they control this and they can match it to that to bypass this check All right Well once they bypass that check and it gets down to here then you've got byte C which is fully attacker controlled value Being written into smart pointer plus C and again since smart pointer is an acid pointer and it can just point anywhere and this is effectively a write what where. And this is a write what where. And this is a write what where. So the where obviously is not completely, you know, unconstrained in the sense of it's, you know, plus CD and 14. But, you know, it is kind of unconstrained in the sense of they can just slide this around however they want. And, you know, this can be any address they want. The only true sort of restriction that they're having here is this notion of the smart pointer bit zero uh, needs to be one. So this is how they visualized it in the original research, and I'm going to drill down on it a little bit more. So the idea is that if the smart pointer gets overwritten, and this is some particular address that the smart pointer points to, then if you want to overwrite offset C and D, for instance, then it needs to be the case that at the smart pointer, bit 0 is equal to 1. So you want to overwrite that, then you need to make sure that this is equal to 1. And ultimately, with that MAC address component, that was six bytes, and it was, you know, at offset six, so plus four, plus one, two is offset six. Uh, then, basically, the attacker has to make sure that this just matches whatever they have in the packet for the MAC address. And ultimately, if you match those constraints, your bit one and your MAC address to whatever is already in memory, then it will successfully write to offset C, and offset D. So you can see in this diagram, unlike uh, what we've been using thus far, we've got uh, low addresses high, high addresses low, but we've also got low addresses within the four bytes to the right instead of the left. So this would be C and this would be D. All right, so basically this is, you know, how the attacker is going to use this smart pointer. Now there's potentially, you know, a few tricks that you have to do to, to get, you know, fully four bytes of write, which is what you really want. So of course we just showed how you can overwrite these bottom two bytes, but if you want to write the next two bytes, well then that induces the extra constraint that this bit right here must be equal to one. And then it just works the same way that you get to write to those two bits. So basically a four byte write just means increase the smart pointer by two and do you know subsequent things. Do one write with two bytes and then move the smart pointer forward by two and then do another write. And then there's another constraint of, well, what if you know the place you want to write, your target does not have a bit that is one uh, C bytes backwards? Well, there then you just skip another C bytes backwards and you say, is that equal to one? And if not, you skip another C bytes backwards and is that equal to one? Because as you skip backwards, when you eventually find something that's one here, then of course you can write forward C bytes, and so you can set this to one with a write, and then that is now one, so now you can set this to one. So again, just by, you know, walking backwards until you find a one and writing forwards with bits that are, have the least significant bit equal to one, you can ultimately still write whatever you want, wherever you want.
So now at this point, the attacker has sort of a limited arbitrary right in the sense of, uh, you know, the, the acid pointer can point where they want, but um, there's this kind of annoying constraint of needing to find one bit in the least significant bit. So now the attacker is going to try to uh, gain sort of a fully arbitrary right. To do this, the way they chose to do it was find a location on the stack that happened to contain a couple of registers that were useful to them. In this case, the program counter, which on, uh, on ARM systems or on uh, Qualcomm hexagon systems, the program counter is the thing that points at the next assembly instruction to run. And then, you know, they also found the R0 register, which is used for the uh, first argument to functions being called. So they found a location where that was, and I believe they said this was on the stack. Um, I may be misremembering, but essentially then they just would overwrite the PC and the R0 by doing the whole skip backwards and write forwards until they ultimately uh, can successfully overwrite it. All right, and that's what I just said. Search for it, yeah, search the stack, and then walk backwards and write forwards. Now at this point, the assumption is that they've successfully overwritten the program counter register and the R0 register, which can be used to specify an argument. So then they have to call some function. So here they're saying, you know, they're using function-oriented programming, which is really just a, a exploity way to say that you're calling functions that are already available in the code. And uh, historically, that was more commonly called just return to libc type uh, exploitation. But uh, once ROP and return-oriented programming got popular, then people started calling this function-oriented programming. So the idea is they now control the program counter. They can cause the code to jump to some existing code. And then using that existing code and using the fact that they control R0, then they will cause a write to some arbitrary location. So if this, you know, first of all, you're not supposed to know assembly in this class, and that's fine. And even if you do know assembly, this may not look familiar to you uh, because this is not just normal ARM assembly or something like that. This is uh, Qualcomm hexagon assembly. So anyways, what this is saying right here is that, you know, write R4 to the memory location pointed to by R0 plus 4. And then you have to ask, where does R4 come from? Well, R4 comes from here, which comes from R2. But unfortunately, the researchers didn't really show us how they control R4 or R2. So we're just going to have to, you know, take them at their word and take them at their proof of concept video that they uh, successfully controlled these other registers. So I'm going to choose to assume that in the same way that they found some location that they could overwrite to overwrite these registers, they found ways to overwrite R4 and or R2 uh, in order to set arbitrary registers. And I have to assume that because we'll see shortly with some other part of the exploit that it assumes that they successfully controlled a bunch of different registers, not just R0. So at this point, now the attacker has the capability to call some existing function that exists in the code that is going to write to a location they control, which is held by the R0 register, and write a value that they control. So now they have a full write what where. That is, uh, that is not constrained by that little checks on, you know, is bit zero equal to one. Okay, so now they have to consider exploit mitigations that are in play. So this is actually surprisingly good for firmware. It's saying that, you know, address space layout randomization is enabled. Heap cookies to try to prevent some heap exploitation are enabled. Stack cookies are enabled. Write X or X, the non-executable memory is enabled, and some other custom things specific to this Qualcomm system. So the attacker needs to, at this point, bypass the write X or X. They need to inject some shell code, but they can't just put it on the heap, they can't just put it on the stack, because that memory is going to be marked as non-executable. So how do they get around that? Well, they need to just change the permissions of memory. So to achieve that, now that they've got this capability of overwriting you know, the program counter and various registers, they're going to overwrite the program counter uh, to overwrite a function pointer. They're going to call that function pointer uh, with arbitrary arguments. So specifically, the function that they want to call is a function called create mapping. So this already exists in the code, and its job is to take a location in physical memory and map it at a particular virtual memory address. So now again, I said that, you know, at this point, we have to assume that they can successfully control all of these registers. And these are basically the arguments to create mapping, which are a virtual address where you want something to be mapped, 
physical address that holds the initial you know, code or data, the size to be mapped, some other argument that they don't know, and the permissions of the mapping. So the idea here is that uh, there's going to be a virtual address that is readable and non-writable and executable, and that corresponds to a particular physical address. And, you know, basically they found that this physical address was always consistently, you know, mapped to this virtual address. But so what they do is they call create mapping, and they specify for the first argument, they want to put it at 42420000, and that means it's going to take this physical address and mark it, put it here, and they're specifically going to pass permissions to say, I want this memory to be readable, writable, executable. So basically, they just need to get their code there somehow and then ultimately execute that code. All right, so now they called the existing code to change the permissions to read, write, execute, and now they need to write ACID code to that read, write, execute page. So at this point, they are again, you know, just playing this game of, you know, overriding function pointers, pointing to you know, arbitrary locations. In this case, they're going to trigger some code that is going to copy data from the over-the-air packet, specifically the shellcode data, into address 4242000. This is the memory that they had just created a mapping for that is going to be readable, writable, and executable. So they do that, and boom, you've got shellcode now in that memory. And then they need to execute the shellcode, and at this point, they can just execute, you know, using the original mapping. Not really sure why they chose to execute using the original mapping instead of the read, write, execute mapping. But, you know, here we see that that same address that they said before, they said B0000 was the same physical memory as 42420000. And so ultimately, they just overwrite a function pointer, point to this readable, executable memory, and then execute that. And boom, the successful attacker has achieved their trophy and they've executed arbitrary code in the context of the WLAN firmware. But they don't want to stop there, right? That's not necessarily where all the goodies are stored. So they're going to, from the WLAN, try to compromise the sort of adjacent modem firmware. Now, this is uh, just playing a game that's very common in firmware sort of attacks where the WLAN has its physical memory and it's mapped into its virtual address space. And there you know, is other memory for the modem, for the baseband, that is mapped into the virtual address space, but it's non-writable. Uh, so again, they can just play a game of saying, let's take that physical memory for the modem that has, for instance, some code in it, and let's map that into my virtual address space as read, write, execute. And then I can just scribble all over the code and boom, I've successfully executed code in the modem. So a uh, previous boss of mine liked to call it firmware parkour when an attacker would successfully bounce from one firmware to the next firmware. So this is exactly what it's like. It's firmware parkour, parkour. And now they've got some more parkour to do because they've successfully broken into the baseband, but now they want to break into the Linux kernel. Now, you know, they didn't necessarily have to break into the baseband of the modem. Uh, there's usually attack surfaces from the Wi-Fi directly into the kernel, but for whatever reason, they decided that they felt the attack surfaces uh, from the modem would be more profitable to try to break into the kernel. So once you're in the modem, then you've got these variety of attack surfaces here, all sorts of different ways that the kernel talks to the modem and user space apps or trust zone may or may not talk to the modem. And what they said is we found an arbitrary memory read-write vulnerability that could bypass all the mitigations for the Linux kernel from the modem into the Linux kernel in these attack surfaces that they covered on the previous slide, but we are unable to disclose the details now. Well, boom, successful parkour and everyone's happy, but boo to not disclosing the details. But later on after the conference talk, once the uh, Android disclosure was finally uh, done, they, you know, provided pointers to the Android uh, advisory. So now at this point, the attacker has successfully compromised the application processor. You know, they can go, you know, read all your mail in your Android phone. They can go, you know, see every website you go to and all the other things you would expect of a full kernel compromise of an Android phone. So we previously said the fix for the cellular, mo uh, sorry, for the Wi-Fi was not actually known. Uh, what was the fix for the actual breaking into the kernel? Well, there at least it's an uh, Android um, advisory, so you can go and check out the patch if you're so inclined. But 
The fix really comes down to sanity checks on the memory ranges that the kernel is willing to operate on.